Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang dhammang Sankang Namasami <clears throat> I always have a problem getting this microphone up to my level. So I hope everyone can hear this okay. So it's the opposite of night, it's the new moon of November. And uh, we've all gathered together, or most of us. And so <clears throat> this morning the monks and nuns listened to the recitation of their different rules. And then our, just before the meal we had lay people visiting, taking the five precepts. And now uh, lay residents, lay, lay guests residents have taken the eight precepts. So this is a very, very usual monastic form, but a very important one in my view. So it's not just the Apostle night, it's also the Katina season. So um, many people are away, as you must have observed, the Sangha is pretty short in terms of its numbers compared to what it normally is. Uh, right now we have, uh, today we had the Katina at Hartridge Monastery in Devon and uh, also in Milne, Milne Tume. So several nuns went up to Milne Tune, which is a hermitage in southern Scotland uh, with uh, the head nun being Ajahn Chantasiri there. And in fact, uh, it was only a week or so ago that I was in Milne Tune myself because um, <clears throat> I've been traveling quite a lot myself. I was away for the Vasa in Hungary and uh, and then after about four days back here, I went up to Harnham, the monastery in Northumberland, to attend uh, an elders council meeting. And then <clears throat> after a couple of days there, on the Saturday we drove, that's about nine or 10 monks drove to Milne Tume because we, most of us had never been there before. So we saw this very beautiful uh, small Hermitage, um, a rather, I have to say, rather cold house, but very, very beautiful environment and uh, exceptionally beautiful colors at that time of year. Uh, wonderful stream and lake and pond and so forth, and quite extensive property. And Ajahn Chandasiri made us very welcome. And I also have to say that there was a couple there, I think Billy was his name and Joanna was his wife. And they made a most wonderful meal for us. I think it was very unusual to have so many people visiting Milntune. And Billy, it turned out, was somebody who has walked the coasts of Britain, probably just Great Britain, and he's done the whole coast. Uh, in about 10 years, he's walked the whole length of the coast of Great Britain. And Joanna has accompanied him on many of those walks. And what they were saying was that when you undertake that particular discipline, of walking and walking, whether you want to walk or you don't, you keep walking, uh, you do experience some pretty amazing breakthroughs, changes of perception about things. One of them being that we are, if you like, trapped into certain patterns of movement. We move between certain places, along roads, along railway lines. But when you do walk in these very lesser known places. It takes you into spaces and areas you'd never dreamt existed. And you see things and experience things that you never thought were there. So <clears throat> it was very interesting, not just to meet this man, who apparently I only learned later was, is terminally ill, but also to hear about some of his experiences in this walking. And I'd like to come back to that a little bit later, to this man, Billy. Yeah, 
guests. So next next week there will be a Katina at Chithurst. Many people will go away for that. And the following week there will be the Katina here at Amravati. And I'm told we're expecting about 1,200 people. And because it's a royal Katina uh, here, the probably the ambassador from Thailand will be coming. Certainly some very important dignitaries from the Thai embassy will, will be coming here. So it's very much an important uh, event for Amravati and indeed for the Thai community. So these are the these constitute some of the monastic contexts within which we're living and and practicing. But of course there is the society outside and what the society is uh, focused on. So <clears throat> what struck me was the fact that uh, yesterday there was what they call Armistice Day. Now normally Armistice Day uh, is held on a Sunday. In fact, it's called Remembrance Sunday. But uh, this weekend, the 11th of the month, fell on the Saturday. So they decided to have Armistice Day on the Saturday. So for British people, this is a very familiar con uh, <clears throat> concept. Uh, remembering the Armistice. But for some other people from other cultures, it might be a little bit strange or even unknown. And I've noticed, because I've been in Central Europe uh, in recent years, that some other countries don't mark it at all. They, they don't remember the First World War. They, they just about remember the Second World, World War. But here in Britain, we remember the First World War and the Second World War. <clears throat> and people buy these red poppies they display on their uh, buttonholes. And the money goes to help servicemen and women who've suffered in one way or another in conflicts. Um, and there's a, a particular place in London called the Cenotaph where people go, or there are big marches there and people stand in silence for a couple of minutes, perhaps all over the country, I'm not sure, but certainly at the Cenotaph and probably the king was there. So it really is quite a big deal in terms of British culture. So what was the armistice? Well, this was the <coughs> excuse me. This was the end of the First World War. So <coughs> this armistice was arranged for the eleventh hour of the eleventh day of the eleventh month of 1918, and it brought the uh, conflict or the, the immediate warfare to an end at that moment. And uh, what was so terrible about that war was it was the first properly or fully industrialized war. So people were like fed into situations where they were almost bound to die in huge numbers and millions of people perished. So it became as a terrible shock to the society. In fact, it left very deep scars and um, was a major watershed for Europe. So as I say, an industrial scale of killing each other, which was quite new. I think up to that time, war had been conceived of even as quite glamorous and uh, exciting. But from that time onwards, it could no longer be regarded in that way. And people were so horrified by the conflict and the loss of life and the damage and destruction that they decided to call this war, well, they called it the Great War at that stage, but they also called it the War to End War. That's how they managed to reassure themselves that things could get better, the War to End War. Unfortunately, it was not the War to End War because only 21 years later there was another World War and then in the wake of that war, we've had numerous conflicts ever since. And currently we have two quite uh, unpleasant conflicts going on, as we all know. 
And what seems what stands out for me <clears throat> is that the military technology, the the hardware, and all of course all the you know the technological marvels that we're getting used to now have improved dr dramatically. So you can you know send in cruise missiles and they'll land more or less where you want them to land, or you spy on people, you you can uh, tap their phones, um, track where they are, all the rest of it. You have these uh, drones and cluster bombs and goodness knows what else. All this technology has advanced dramatically because we have this ability to think in a linear terms, solving problems one after another with great ingenuity. But in terms of the human beings, we don't seem to have advanced very much at all. And so uh, the Buddha had a phrase for, uh, I think it was for worldly gain, he talked about dung beetles, um, people who were just building, you know, dung hills for themselves. But I suppose we could use a term like that, but perhaps the, a better term would be the, the caveman mentality. We still have the caveman mentality. It's just that we have improved, uh, if you like, the the club that we use uh, to kill other people or to or to harm them so this is why i like to reflect on the precepts that we've just taken or some of you have just taken because the first one is about not to destroy living creatures not to harm living beings to respect life uh, if at all possible and um it's quite nice if we just reflect for a moment, supposing all human beings were prepared or interested enough to take that precept and even to live by it, to try to, to observe the precept, what kind of a world would it be? It would be an extraordinarily different world, wouldn't it? Very um, transformed world if we, if we respected that precept, just that single precept. So it might seem to some people that taking precepts on an evening like this is a not terribly significant thing to do. But if we take it in the context of all the, the way that humanity is developing or has developed, I think it is a very significant thing to do. <clears throat> because if we take these precepts seriously, if we bring mindfulness, attention, you know, uh, and, and <clears throat> awareness to the precepts, then it means a lot. Is the people can prepared to commit to these restrictions on their freedom of action and to ab abiding by certain principles? Particularly if we can bring in, as we take the precepts, the, the mindful, mindfulness and awareness around what the precept actually says. Of course, it's possible to, to, look, to repeat a precept by rote. That's possible. We may do that on occasions. But it's also possible to take that precept fully aware of what it's saying and indeed to go beyond that and to reflect, to use that precept as a way of reflecting on our own behavior. You know, how have I been doing in the last few, if you like, last few days? Have I been living up to the standards I would like to live up to? The precepts can help shine a light into these areas in our, in our life, in our psyche. And we could, if we, if we are honest with ourselves and you know, bring in, uh, if you like, the searchlight into our own behaviors and speech, we can begin to register um, where we might need to raise the game, where we might need to improve our behaviors and our speech. I can certainly think of a few areas myself. So we have this capacity to consider, to reflect, to contemplate. <clears throat> and to use these teachings as a way of um, developing our own understanding and our own uh, ability to live in the world in a skillful way, in a wholesome way.
Now, Ajahn Chah, I've read one or two um, talks by Ajahn Chah where he talks about humans and animals. He says, basically, we're not so different. Uh, just like animals, humans want to escape suffering, or just like us, they want to escape suffering. Um, they're drawn to that which is pleasant. They want to escape that which is painful. Uh, nobody, whether they're human or an animal, wants to die. Uh, we all want to live as long as possible, most of us. But I'm, I'm wondering if there aren't one or two different, quite important differences. For example, one is that it seems to me human beings have a much greater capacity at least to show love, but also to show or to cultivate hatred. And <clears throat> we seem to be able to... This is where we're so different from animals, because if you take a species, like whether they're giraffes or lions or elephants or whatever, they might fight over territory, or they might fight over uh, mates or courtship and things like that, um, and they might fight over food, but they're not out to make war on their own species. They don't try to kill each other, uh, as far as I'm aware. Animals you know, of a species try to preserve uh, their species. And yet human beings are certainly ready to make war and to destroy other human beings. And in particular, we have this way of dividing into groups and seeing each other, seeing other people in a, in a, in a different light. They're the, the, they're the other. So it could be based on a nationality, it could be based on ethnic group, it could be based on religious affiliation or some kind of belief system, uh, or there are 101 ways that we can see people as being the other. So it could be about, for example, a debate like about um, um, LGBTQ, trans, or Brexit, or whatever. We, ca we have a way of we have a way of uh, slipping into dehumanizing others, whether it's based on a difference in identity or maybe a difference in viewpoint. And, and so if this is carried to an extreme, it becomes something like those people are vermin and they should be wiped out. And indeed, I, <clears throat> I've been several times in Australia. One of my uncles lived in Australia. And uh, the third wife he married was, um, was a, a lady from Yorkshire called Marge. And I remember, well, I, didn't, I wasn't present for this, but my mother reports this because she was present, that Marge, it was, this was a coach trip to Tasmania or something, and she was saying about Aboriginals, they should be wiped out. So um, we know that this, this kind of attitude can permeate uh, the human psyche. And when we get into these kind of uh, psychological areas, then it's very easy to develop hatred. So the Buddhist words on how to bring hatred to an end are very clear and very simple. If you go to the Dhammapada, the first chapter of the twin verses, verse number five, hatreds, hatreds never cease through hatred in this world. They, hatred only ceases through non-hatred, in other words, loving kindness or generosity, things like this. Um, this is an eternal law. This is an ancient principle. So it's very clear, very simple, and very logical. So you can bomb and blast people uh, to death, and you can drive them out of their homes and destroy their homes and all the rest of it. But that's not a way to destroy hatred. That's not bringing hatred to an end. So what happens in those circumstances when people make such violent war on each other is that the hatred goes underground and it just resurfaces later on in a different generation. So it's, it's really just delaying the effects and the cycle goes on and on, and we know that. It's the cycles go on and on of, of this hatred. And there's so many examples of this. 
But what I suppose some non-Buddhists might say, well, this is all very glib and easy. You know, the Buddha said, hatred ceased through non-hatred. Well, what did he mean? I think what he meant was that we have to bear with and to tolerate and be patient with people who are being provocative or difficult or even threatening to us. And we have to work with those negative feelings, uh, not just to respond to them, but work with them and try to acknowledge that even if someone is being threatening or unpleasant, that they are human, they have, um, and maybe they're coming from some kind of a position or belief that we don't fully understand. So to try to engage with them, if it's at all possible. So when you, when we talk about people being greedy, or full of hatred, or deluded, at least some of this seems to come from fear. So if people are very afraid that they won't get enough of something or that it's going to be taken away from them, they become quite greedy. If they're afraid that they're going to be harmed or attacked, they become aggressive. And also this a fear about facing up to difficult mind states or difficult situations that can very easily lead on to states of delusion. So fear has one, is one, one aspect in this. The f we, we succumb easily to fear. So that's something else we have to get to know quite, quite well. And to understand it and to, to acknowledge it. So one principle would be non-recrimination, non-retaliation, wherever possible, in terms of our practice. So <clears throat> there is this violent, what I would see as a, violent, a strain of violence in, in Western society, which is now sort of exported around the world. Of course, it's not to say that only only Europeans have been violent, of course, that would be ridiculous, but um, there has been this glorification of war and of violence in our culture. Uh, I think, as I was saying before the First World War, there was a glorification of, of war, which I don't think happens so much now. So in that sense, we've developed a bit. But in, you know, prior to the First World War, people were, at the time of the First World War being declared, people were very willing to sign up to join armies and with the kind of delusion that they would be able to invade other people's countries very easily. And <clears throat> again, uh, an, an, an illustration from Australia, people were very willing to rush from their farms in Australia to join the army to, to help the British Empire. And a few years ago, I was on this island. It's called Kangaroo Island, off the south of Australia. And there's a park on that island called the Soldiers, Soldiers Park. And if you go in through the front gate of the park and you look up, you see this inscription about for empire. And people really believed at that stage that the empire was something worth fighting for, dying for, and so forth. So in that sense, war could be considered glorious at that stage. I think we've, we've let go of that, I'm glad to say. But there's still the glorification of violence. And if we think about the, you know, the films that we see, the television programs and so forth, there is an awful lot of that. It's entertaining, it's exciting. Um, it keeps people happy and entertained. But um, if you think about a Clint Eastwood film, uh, usually at the end of the film or cowboy films there were sort of mounds of dead people um, also in the dirty harry series and many other films like that where um, killing people or violence was held up to be a noble or a mature thing to do i remember a, a film with uh, john wayne in it and a young boy uh, goes into a saloon and shoots several people in the saloon and he comes out at the end of the film and he's now a man, a real man, because he's killed people. 
And of course, in the States, we have this, there is this culture of gun violence. And uh, many shootings occur that we never hear about. Ajahn Anando, who now lives in the States, in Temple Monastery, tells me that, in fact, there are school shootings, school massacres every week in, in America. Um, but you don't normally hear about them because they only report uh, the massacres when there are 20 or more dead. That's quite something. And uh, even in Britain, we've had, we've had these occasional massacres. I remember one in Hungerford uh, back in the 80s where um, a man had been watching violent videos for two days, solid, and he came out with all these weapons and started shooting people in their front gardens. And uh, then we had the one at Dunblane, and there have been various other incidents, as you well know, of, of quite heavy violence here. Now, the other strand I'd like to look at is that of exploitation. And I don't mean so much exploiting people, but exploiting resources. And this is something that's part of our culture. And I'm not sure where it fully comes from. But I'm not fully sure where it comes from, but it may come, there may be a strand of it coming from Christianity. But if you believe that God created the earth for human beings and made all the plants and the animals and whatever else there is available to humans for their use, then we can take and use whatever we want if we think it's useful or helpful to us to do so. So this has led us to the state we're in now in the, with the planet. So we've <clears throat> cut down the forests, we've gouged out innumerable minerals from the earth, we've fished the seas so some of them are almost empty, uh, and so on and so on. I think you know the story as well as I do. Uh, look at some of the minerals, the coal, the gas, oil, precious stones, and then all these very rare minerals that are useful now in, in modern technology. Um, <clears throat> so we've, we've done all of that, and it's now become, if you like, the world culture. This has been exported around the world. And when you think about people in traditional societies, I'm thinking of Native Americans in North America or Aboriginal people in Australia, when they witnessed this behavior, I think they were aghast and horrified because what they were used to was a culture of balance where you lived or tried to live in harmony with nature. So, okay, it wasn't perhaps a very comfortable life compared to what we've had, but it was trying to live in harmony rather than uh, um, fighting nature. So, for example, in Australia, uh, we have some very huge mining companies now. Uh, they, they use, uh, you know, they mine the, the, the land. And they come into conflict with these Aboriginal groups for whom the land was, was alive, or at least very important, sacred, because it contained the bones of their ancestors. Um, maybe because they thought there were spirits in the land, I don't know. But these two cultures come head on against each other. And there's very little understanding of, of, of these traditional cultures. In North America, uh, American Indians lived, again, roughly in harmony with nature. They it was so important to them that nature supported their life that they would not wish to overbalance it or, or destroy it. So that's why for the traditional cultures, the Western approach was so uh, difficult to comprehend. They could see, that, you know, that from their point of view, it wasn't sustainable. But who was going to listen to them? After all, they were uh, savages or um, heathens. Uh, they were uneducated. They couldn't read or write. Uh, they were not Christian. That was very important in that stage. And also they weren't white. But as, we, as the whole thing unfolds and as we begin to experience the results of all these <clears throat> developments and exploitations, um, fossil fuel and all the rest of it, so we start to, to get these very unfortunate uh, extreme weather events 
floods and all the rest of it that are, is occurring around the, the globe. So we, we should perhaps pause and ask ourselves, well, maybe they were right. Maybe they knew what they were talking about. Now in the, in the Vinaya, uh, it seems to me that the, the Buddha indicates that he was very interested in preserving nature or working in harmony with nature. Um, not that he laid down these rules for everybody, because he acknowledged that people had to get a living from the land and um, there had to be hunters and so forth. He understood that. But for the monks and nuns, there were some quite interesting rules. One is that in the rains retreat, when uh, the crops are growing, the monks are not supposed to, to walk around the fields destroying the crops. And there are many other restrictions on their freedom. So, for example, we're not supposed to uh, dig the earth if it hasn't been disturbed. So if it has been disturbed, we can move earth. But if it hasn't been disturbed, we can't dig the earth. We can't um, cut anything out of the earth. And if there's a living plant, we can't cut or burn or kill the plant. So that means we can't go around um, cutting grass or <clears throat> you know, lopping uh, branches off trees. And it means, of course, that we can't, with, that coupled with the thing that we can't um, kill living beings, it means that we can't be farmers. So a lot of these rule, uh, rules were formulated remembering that in these environments there are a lot of living creatures. So whether you know whether it's in the earth or in the plant on the plants, if we do things to them, uh, we we tend to disturb the creatures or even kill them. And perhaps for people of that that era, they believed also there were spirits in the trees, and that if they cut the trees down, they would disturb those spirits or devas. And then we're not supposed to <coughs> to light a fire for warmth unless it's for our health so uh, you know there's got to be a very good reason to light a fire again if you light a fire you you know bring death and destruction on on many creatures so this comes from an era when people were uh, you know, recognizing how much they depended on nature and how it, important it was to live in harmony with nature. This is how I would see it. And uh, <clears throat> with the technological science and the technological developments, we're becoming more and more removed from nature. It's harder and harder for people to have contact with nature. So yesterday there was a young person's one-day retreat and one of the young people was saying that uh, you know, nowadays children or young people don't play outside so much in the evening because they're all, you know, inside with their computers or their devices or playing computer games. So anyway, this is this this thing about exploitation. It was the second strand I want to draw wanted to draw attention to. And I heard an interview over the summer. It was with um, a lady scientist, or a, probably she was an astronomer, and she was talking about asteroids. And she was saying, well, we're getting to the point now where we really begin to understand asteroids or know what, what they're made up of. And sooner or later, we're going to be able to land on asteroids. And then she said, and then we can make use of what we find on the asteroids. So the, the whole attitude that we can exploit whatever we want for our benefit, we will now extend that into outer space. <clears throat> so these are big issues and not easy to see any solutions to them. I thought I would just also t talk a little bit about um, the, the, what I did during the Vasa, which uh, I was in Hungary, and, and then come back to this man uh, I met in Milntum. 
So um, I was fortunate enough to be able to go to, to Hungary to spend the Vasa. Um, it wasn't the first time I'd done it. I've, in previous years, before uh, the pandemic, I was able to go on maybe four or five occasions to, to Hungary. Um, and I was invited there by a group called uh, Dhammapada Foundation, which is a Theravada group. But it's actually one strand of something much bigger, which is called the Dharma Gate Church. So the Dharma Gate Church is a kind of umbrella institution, which happens to have set up uh, a college called the Dharma Gate College. And this is probably the only Buddhist university in Europe. So this is the, the history of Buddhism in, as it develops in Hungary is very different to most places. So as I say, Hungary or Budapest has the only Buddhist university in Europe. So you might well ask, well, how did that come about? So the story goes back to the time of communism in Hungary. And there was a group of people representing all the different Buddhist traditions that used to meet regularly and you know, discuss Dhamma, do some meditation, um, you know, and talk, talk about Buddhism, there was always a secret policeman in the room who was recording what was going on, making notes. Everybody knew who he was. But he must have written that they were very harmless, eccentric people and no threat to the government whatsoever. And uh, so they were allowed to continue with these meetings. So <clears throat> that was going on under communism. And then suddenly in 1989, the most unexpected thing happened. The change, what they call there, the change occurred and communism collapsed. So when that happened, the people in this group got together and they decided or they made the, formulated the ambition to create a Buddhist university in, uh, in Hungary. And uh, over a number of years, they worked very hard to do this, to establish this university. Many of them took very little pay People worked long hours and made many sacrifices. But after about 13 years, they got state accreditation. So it became um, a university funded by, by the government as well as through other sources. So that's what exists now in Budapest. And I won't pretend it's been an easy story. Uh, this place got uh, started on a wing and a prayer, and it's been through many problems and crisis, but it's still going. And in fact, it's attracted thousands of people through its doors. A lot of young people have come in and, and passed through it. And the reason uh, they do that is because, yes, there's, uh, the, the solid core at the center of the studies is, is Buddhist studies. So you, 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 know, you learn about the different traditions of Buddhism and what, what the teachings are. But around that, there are many other very attractive options such as um, oriental healing arts, oriental martial arts. Uh, they were teaching a lot of languages, uh, Japanese, Chinese, Pali and Sanskrit at one time, and in things like Indology. So these things draw in young people and um, make for a very interesting mix. However, I, I'm not usually based in the college. Um, they established this little rather frugal, primitive little center about one hour out of Budapest. So I used to stay in, in this place called Boina, and it became a sort of meditation center. We'd have occasional weekend retreats or sometimes five-day retreats, and people would come out from Budapest and stay overnight or for a few nights and, and make a few meals, and we'd have some interesting conversations. Um, so it was quite a, a, an interesting uh, development. Then came the pandemic, and all that came to an end. And then last year, I was trying to get to Hungary, and all the tickets had been bought. Um, I got on, I, I traveled by train, because I stopped flying, and uh, I got on the Eurostar in St. Pancras, and then about an hour out into the countryside, the train, the train broke down. 
So they said they were repair, repairing the train, repairing something in the cab, but in the end, no, they couldn't. And another engine arrived from London and towed us back into St Pancras. So on that occasion, I missed all my connections. I couldn't get to Hungary on time to enter the Vasa, so I entered the Vasa here. So my main ambition this year was actually to get to Hungary. <clears throat> so this is, um, I was again traveling by train. Things went pretty well. I got to Paris. And then from Paris, took a train to Stuttgart. Now I knew from the itinerary that I only ha would have an 11 minute changeover in Stuttgart. And that worried me. But I accepted what the German railways gave me. Uh, hoping that it would work out, although German railways often are late. So anyway, I was <clears throat> on this train and I knew it was going to be late. We got into Stuttgart late, and then the next, but the next train I was supposed to take also got in late. In fact, it didn't even arrive. And I took a third train from Stuttgart to Augsburg, which was the next place where I was going to change. So again, looking at the clock, you know, I'll be going to get there on time for the final train to Budapest. And we got into Augsburg and I had two minutes to run from one train to the other. So that meant running down a staircase, no escalators, along an underground passage with a heavy case and up another set of stairs uh, onto the right platform. And uh, running along the platform, pushing the case, sort of symboli uh, signaling to people, yes, I'm going onto this train. And they held the train, which is very good. I got into the right carriage, I got to the right compartment, number 82, opened the door, pushed the case in, and found I was sharing with three young women. Monks shouldn't be doing that. However, that wasn't, none of us had known that that was going to be the case, so I wasn't actually breaking a rule. So I climbed up the stair, little stairway, the, the ladder, got onto an upper bunk, and found I was in the most extraordinarily hot place I'd ever traveled in. It was so hot. And so the people on the lower bunks, they were comfortable enough, I think, but the two of us on the upper bunks uh, were very uncomfortable indeed. And on top of that, I have a long, long legs, and I, there's no way I could fit into the, to the sleeper bed uh, on, on these sleeper trains comfortably. So physically, it was quite unpleasant. But it's one of those instances where you can have physical discomfort and yet feel very much at peace. Because I felt, well, I'm on the right train, I'm going to Budapest, I'm actually going to get there. So I felt completely at peace here. So sometimes we can experience great physical, physical comfort and our mind can be in turmoil but we can also experience physical discomfort and our mind be quite at peace. So wherever we go, uh, there is this book written by John Kabat-Zinn, Wherever You Go, There You Are. And I think it's a very good title or a good phrase. Some, some uh, people say it comes from Confucius, wherever you go, there you are. So you can think about traveling somewhere and you know, enjoying the changes of scene. And of course, it's always interesting and fascinating. And it does give you some, some new, new insights and some new perspectives. But basically, you take with you your own mind. So <laughs> the mental habits you have, the moods you have, uh, the, 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 the difficulties that you have go with you. So wherever you go, whether it's Amravati or anywhere else, you still have to work with your mind. So this thing, this phrase, wherever you go, there you are, can be seen in two different ways, it seems to me. One is that, yes, you take with you your difficulties, your problems, your defilements. They go with you wherever you go. But also, you can take with you your mindfulness your sati, your awareness. And wherever you go, there you are. So about Hungary, all I can say is that um, 
It was very nice to meet many old friends, to see some places I hadn't seen in a long time. I was actually not at Boina, I was in a different place in the south, a place called Manfa, um, which was a kind of uh, meditation center used at weekends by different groups. But the approach developed in Hungary seems to be one of you know, academic research. Uh, it's quite a scholarly approach. This is where they're, they're very proud of their scholarly past. And that's why the Ajahn Chah approach is quite different. And I think can be of use to Hungarian Buddhists. So obviously it's good to study the theory of Buddhism. You know, it's good to know something about what the Buddha taught. But if it stops there, then somehow, I th we would say at least, you're missing the point. So Ajahn Chah's similes were, you can, um, you know, you can have a nice bowl of soup in front of you and smell the fragrance of the soup. But if you don't lift the spoon with the soup to the mouth, you never get the taste of it. Or someone else came up with this simile, if you go to a restaurant and you're expecting to eat a, a nice meal, but you eat the menu instead, this is rather like studying the theory without getting into the practice. So when we say practice, I think what we're talking about is basically mindfulness, practicing mindfulness in all postures, and sampajanya, all-round awareness or self-awareness about the appropriacy of what we're doing. Is this really the best thing I could be doing? Or am I wasting my time? Or is this in fact an unskillful or unwholesome thing to do? So Ajahn Chah talks about, you know, in, in Dhamma practice, and he talks about Dhamma fighting, we're not here to conquer other people. We're not seeking to subjugate other people, but we are trying to conquer or bring to heal our own mind. So we are resisting our own moods. We're not following, just following our moods. Whether we want to practice or we don't want to practice, whether we feel diligent or lazy, we keep practicing. Rather like this man Billy and his wife keep walking, uh, kept walking around the, the coast of Britain. If we keep the practice going, that's when we have a chance to, to see a breakthrough, to see, to discover insights worth knowing. So we are resisting defilement, defilement, we're resisting greed, hatred, delusion. These, if you like, are considered to be the, the opponents or the adversaries. So <clears throat> this is the battle to wage in the heart. This is what Dhamma fighting is all about. So we've, I've touched into some areas, probably haven't been particularly enlightening, but at least some things to consider. And I'd like to return to this, this gentleman we met, I met in Milntum, Billy, because I can feel very, very low about, the, you know, the future of the planet or the future of humanity or the fact that we're uh, bumping off so many other species, whether it's flora or fauna, this can be very depressing. But um, he said something to me which was really kind of eye-opening. He said, well, you know, we've been concerned about the environment and the world possibly for the last 2,000 years or so. But don't forget the world has been going for, for billions of years. And the world or the earth will, will solve its own problems uh, in its own way. Um, it may put us in our place, as he said, but it will keep going and it will solve these problems. So that may be a cause for comfort. I hope for some it might be. Um, if we can try to live more in harmony with nature, um, if we can try to draw on these wisdom teachings, then um, 
we're, at least we're not wasting our time and at least we're setting perhaps some kind of example to others, I don't know. And so that's why I commend what people were doing tonight, taking these precepts, very impressive. I commend anyone who's prepared to give time and energy to practice and to study the, the, the teachings of the Buddha. So on that note, I'd like to, to close the talk and wish you a very good evening. May you be well. Sadhu, 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 animal dance.